with the consensus aiming towards an educated public on digital privacy, it's no surprise to see an increasing interest in encryption algorithms. We have already covered the major names like the DES and the AES algorithm. MD5 algorithm was one of the first hashing algorithms to take the global stage as a successor to the MD4. Despite the security vulnerabilities encountered in the future, MD5 still remains a crucial part of data infrastructure in a multitude of environments. So hey everyone, this is Bab from Simply Learn. Welcome to this video on the MD5 hash algorithm. Let us take a look at the topics we need to cover for today's video. We take a look at what is hashing and its principles, examples and applications. We learn about the origin of the MD5 algorithm along with its methodology. We take a look at the steps needed to create hashed values using the MD5 algorithm and finally learn about the prospective advantages for the same. So let us first get acquainted with the concept of hashing and its examples. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of information or data beyond recognition. We can achieve this using hash functions, which are essentially algorithms that perform mathematical operations on the main plain text. The value generated after passing the plain text through the hash function is called the hash value, hash digest, or in general just hash of the original data. While this may sound similar to encryption, the major difference is hashes are made to be irreversible. No decryption key can convert a digest to its original value. However, a few hashing algorithms have been broken down due to the increase in computational complexity of the new generation computers. There are new algorithms that still stand the test of time and are they are being used in multiple areas for password storage, integrity verification, etc. Like we discussed earlier, websites use hashing to store user passwords. So how do they make use of these hashed passwords? When a user signs up to create a new account, the password is then run through the hash function and the resulting digest is stored on our servers. So the next time a user logs into the account, the password he enters is passed through the same hash function. If the digest matches with the one stored in the server, then he is allowed to log in to the account. This way, no plain text passwords get stored, preventing both the owner from snooping on user data and protecting users' privacy in the unfortunate event of a data breach or a hack. We also use hashing when it comes to verifying data integrity. When a file is uploaded onto the internet, it is also passed through a hash function. Once the hash digest is generated, it is uploaded along with the file onto the internet. When a user downloads the file for his or her personal use, they can also get the hash downloaded with it. Once the file is run through the hash function again, the digest is compared to the one provided by the uploader. If the value of both the digests are the same, the data integrity is verified and we can be sure that the data was not corrupted while transit. To generate these hash digests from a standard input, we use hash functions. Such an example of a hash function is the MD5 algorithm. Let us learn more about it in our main focus for the day. The MD5 hashing algorithm is a one-way cryptographic function that accepts a message of any length as input and it returns as output a fixed length digest value to be used for authenticating the original messages. The digest size is always 128 bits irrespective of the input. The MD5 hash function was originally designed for use as a secure cryptographic hash algorithm to authenticate digital signatures. MD5 has also been depreciated for uses other than as a non-cryptographic checksum to verify data integrity and detect unintentional data corruption. Ronald Rivest, founder of RSA Data Security and Institute professor at MIT, designed MD5 as an improvement to a prior message digest algorithm which was the MD4. As already iterated before, the process is straightforward. We pass a plain text message to the MD5 hash functions, which in turn perform certain mathematical operations on the clear text to scramble the data. The 128-bit digest received from this is going to be radically different from the plain text. The goal of any message digest function is to produce digests that appear to be random. To be considered cryptographically secure, the hash function should meet two requirements. First, that it is impossible for an attacker to generate a message that matches a specific hash value 
and second that it is impossible for an attacker to create two messages that produce the same hash value. Even a slight change in the plain text should trigger a drastic difference in the two digests. This goes a long way in preventing hash collisions which take place when two different plain texts have the same digest. To achieve this level of intricacy, there are a number of steps to be followed before we receive the digest. Let us take a look at the detailed procedure as to how the MD5 hash algorithm works. The first step is to make the plain text compatible with the hash function. To do this, we need to pad the bits in the message. When we receive the input string, we have to make sure the size is 64 bits short of a multiple of 512. When it comes to padding the bits, we must add one first followed by zeros to round out the extra characters. This prepares a string to have a length of just 64 bits less than any multiple of 512. Here on out, we can proceed on to the next step where we have to pad the length bits. Initially in the first step, we appended the message in such a way that the total length of the bits in the message was 64 bits short of any multiple of 512. Now we add the length bits in such a way that the total number of bits in the message is perfectly a multiple of 512. That means 64 bit lengths to be precise are added to the message. Our final string to be hashed is now a definite multiple of 512. The next step would be to initialize the message digest buffer. The entire hashing plain text is now broken down into 512 bit blocks. There are four buffers or registers that are of 32 bits each named A, B, C and D. These are the four words that are going to store the values of the, each of these sub blocks. The first iteration to follow these registers will have fixed hexadecimal values as shown on the screen below. Once these values are initialized, of these 512 blocks, we can divide each of them into 16 further sub blocks of 32 bits each. For each of these sub blocks, we run four rounds of operations having the four buffer variables A, B, C, and D. These rounds require the other constant variables as well, which differ with each round of operation. The constant values are stored in a random array of 64 elements. Since each 32 bit sub block is run four times, 16 such subblocks equal 64 constant values needed for a single block iteration. The subblocks can be denoted by the alphabet M and the constant values are denoted by the alphabet T. Coming to the actual round of operation, we see our four buffers which already have pre-initialized values for the first iteration. At the very beginning, the values of buffers B, C and D are passed on to a non-linear logarithmic function. The formula behind this function changes by the particular round being worked on as we shall see later in this video. Once the output is calculated, it is added to the raw value stored in buffer A. The output of this addition is added to the particular 32-bit subblock using which we are running the four operations. The output of this requisite function then needs to be added to a constant value derived from the constant array k. Since we have 64 different elements in the array, Repeat. Since we have 64 different elements in the array, we can use a distinct element for each iteration of a particular block. The next step involves a circular shift that increases the complexity of the hash algorithm and is necessary to create a unique digest for each individual input. The output generated is later added to the value stored in the buffer B. The final output is now stored in the second buffer of B of the output register. Individual values of C, D and A are derived from the preceding element before the iteration started, meaning the value of B gets stored in C, value of C gets stored in D and the value of D in A. Now that we have a full register ready for this subblock, the values of A, B, C, D are moved on as input to the next subblock. Once all 16 subblocks are completed, the final register value is saved and the next 512 bit block begins. At the end of all these blocks, we get a final digest of the MD5 algorithm. Regarding the non-linear process mentioned in the first step, the formula changes for each round it's being run on. This is done to maintain the computational complexity of the algorithm and to increase randomness of the procedure. 
the formula for each of the four rounds uses the same parameters that is B, C and D to generate a single output. The formulas being used are shown on the screen right now. Algorithm. Unlike the latest hash algorithm families, a 32-bit digest is relatively easier to compare when verifying the digests. They don't consume a noticeable amount of disk storage and are comparatively easier to remember and reiterate. Passwords need not be stored in plain text format, making them accessible for hackers and malicious actors. When using digest, the database security also gets a boost since the size of all the hash values will be the same. In the event of a hack or a breach, the malicious actor will only receive the hashed values, so there is no way to regenerate the plain text which would be the user passwords in this case. Since the functions are irreversible by design, hashing has become a compulsion when storing user credentials on the server nowadays. A relatively low memory footprint is necessary when it comes to integrating multiple services into the same framework without a CPU overhead. The digest size is the same and the same steps are run to get the hash value irrespective of the size of the input string. This helps in creating a low requirement for computational power and is much easier to run on older hardware which is pretty common in server farms around the world. We can monitor file corruption by comparing hash values before and after transit. Once the hashes match, file integrity checks are valid and we can avoid data corruption. Hash functions will always give the same output for the similar input irrespective of the iteration parameters. It also helps in ensuring that the data hasn't been tampered with on route to the receiver of the message. Hope you learned something interesting today. If you have any queries regarding the topic, feel free to ask us in the comment section and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Subscribe to our channel for more amazing content like this and thank you for watching. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.